Turn with me to Matthew, if you would. Jesus is our example. He is the one who set the stage for all of us. He's the only one, the only one we should be following. Last week, we talked about the fact that wise men still seek Him. And the reality that wise men still seek Him means you're either wise today or you're not. (laughs) You're either a wise man or you're a wise guy. Which one are you going to be? And the reality is, what will set you apart from being a wise guy to being a wise person is sometimes the things you're willing to leave behind. You know, you watch these athletes and you watch them succeed, you watch them as they receive the golden medal, and it's always the focus a lot of times on what they did. You swam this fast, you hit this far, you ran this fast, you caught this ball, you did this, you did this. But a lot of times we miss out on what really got them to that place, even provided the opportunity for them to experience that event. It wasn't so much what they did, it was a lot of what they didn't do. The person who says, I, I'm not going out tonight. Why? Well, because I got this coming up. It was not going out that set the stage. The person who said, I'm going to stop doing this because I want this, it's when they said no to this that they began to set the framework for them to be able to succeed. The greatest in the business world, the greatest in the economic world will tell you, you have got to make a choice. Not so much of what you want, but what you're willing to let go of in order to get what you're after. Take a look today in chapter 3 about, first of all, a man who who abandoned a lot of things in order to become what God had for him in store, in store for him. John, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Guess what he abandoned? Guess what he chose to leave behind? (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Very good. That diet, first of all, is, the, is one of the first things that stands out because like, ugh, or as my household has heard lately, ugh. Did I get that right? No, I messed that up too. I'll skip it. That's just not very appetizing. Locusts and wild honey. However, I have to tell you, I can't say it's not appetizing because I've tried it. But the fact that John the Baptist was willing to say, you know what? I'm going to let some stuff go. I know I need to eat. Honey and locust is all I need. But that's not all he let go, is it? He was set apart not only by the diet, he was set apart by his choice of apparel. You know, you are judged on a daily basis by a very uh, shallow judgment. You're judged on what you wear. That's why the clothing industry has boomed like it has. Billions and billions of dollars have been spent because they've convinced you that if you don't have this, you ain't nothing. John the Baptist said, I don't need that. I was going to go into a long list, but some of the names I use, they're not even around anymore, like FUBU. Why? Because that stuff's temporary. John said, I'll sell for a camel's skin. And the leather belt, that's all I need. Matter of fact, if you've seen some of the pictures, I've often kidded Brandon sometimes that he kind of got that John the Baptist look every once in a while. Just kind of her. Today we call it, what's that show with Cy and the Duck, yeah, the Duck Dynasty. That was a senior moment. Got lost in my beard. The reality is, John the Baptist said, I'm done. I'm not going that way. 
of popularity. I'm not going that way of fame. I'm going to let some of those things go. I'm not even going to worry about what people think if they see a locust leg stuck in my beard. Or if I get some honey. I'm okay with that. And as a result, John the Baptist becomes the forerunner. Matter of fact, Jesus said, John the Baptist was the greatest in the kingdom. Wow. See what a little locust and honey and that's not what did it, was it? What did it was John's passion to please God more than to please society, to be set apart. Verse 5, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and, to get, and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What John was able to to do right there by confronting the scribes and Pharisees. These were people of authority. These were people in positions. These were known names. What he was able to do by confronting them with the truth leads me to the conclusion that John had lost his self-defense mechanisms. He was not worried what other people thought about his clothing or his diet. And when it came to telling the truth to people, he was not worried about how they were going to respond to him. He was more concerned about being honest than being liked. He was more concerned about being able to show somebody the error of their ways and challenge them to repent, to change, than to just pat them on the back. And say, well, you're, you're a good person. That kind of confidence only comes when you've settled some things. You've settled what other people think about you and you've chosen to embrace God's opinion and God's approval more than others. Even religious leaders. And I'm challenging you today, there's a lot of religious leaders out there and through media and all the stuff, they're, they're getting a whole lot of influence. In the midst of it all, resolve your heart and your mind today that it only matters if God is happy. It only matters if Jesus is smiling on your daily thought life, your prayer life, your eating, your sleeping, in everything, everything, let Him be glorified. And when you find that place, you will find a confidence to confront some of the towers and the powers in your life. Just as John was able to confront those. Then Jesus, verse 13, came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John sets the stage. He sets the stage by, by, by promoting this idea that I am not concerned about societal secrets. John, really, you're still wearing camel hair in the midst of Nike? 
You're still wearing camel hairs in the midst of all of the fine satin and leather and all this other stuff you could be wearing. Matter of fact, it challenges some of our modern day prosperity, doesn't it? When we find prophets and teachers having all kinds of provisions, pastors living beyond what is considered to be sufficient. And we wonder sometimes why we're challenged. Could it be that we've been swallowed by the idea of prosperity? I think it has. John sets the stage by saying, this is God's plan for my life and I am going to fulfill it to the end. And when Jesus walks on the scene, he joins in that same mindset. You see, what's in that portion of Scripture right there is, first of all, Jesus leaves His homeland, His hometown, Nazareth. He had a career laid out for Him. He had family. He had friends. We know from verses later on that there were some people who could not embrace the fact that Jesus was not who He used to be. I've been thinking about shaving this goatee off for several weeks. Didn't quite know how it would be accepted. Because I can't remember the last time I've not had it. <laughs> and it was very interesting to see the responses from my wife, my children, and some of y'all. <laughs> Simply because this much of my face is different. <laughs> One daughter was quoted as saying, I don't know you. <laughs> I thought, what? Now this can grow back, and it can be cut off again. I wonder sometimes how shallow we are in our relationships. And I pray that in 40 days, God will convict us all and allow us to grow deeper in our relationship, not just with Him, but with each other. Because see, what Jesus was for those 30 years, before He ever left Nazareth, what he was in that time was the Almighty. But he was the Almighty in a very normal situation. He had household, mom, dad, all that kind of stuff was evident. Tradition said, you're the oldest son, you carry on the career we know Jesus was accredited to being a carpenter, which means Joseph did a good job teaching him a trade. Today we would say, look at this. we just had a stool that Jesus touched. A table that Jesus worked on. Imagine that, made by Jesus. Wouldn't that be awesome? But he was more than that, wasn't he? But in order to become... And set the stage for what would happen in the rest of his life. There was a moment in which Jesus had to say, I am not going to let my past, the norm of 30 years, keep me and hold me back. I'm breaking the mold. I'm setting the stage for something brand new. And so he leaves mom. He leaves brothers. He leaves community. He leaves career. He says, I'm going now, some of you may be challenged this, this year to say, there's some things I need to set behind. And for those of you that are still teenagers, your parents are not an option. Jesus left home. You can't. How, why? Number one, you're not 30 yet. And if you're here and you are 30 and you're still at home, it's time. <laughs> but the reality is, Jesus was faithful until that time. And for some of you, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm feeling that there may be a very good point in this year for you to do what Jesus did and make some separation between the things of the past and the future that God has for you. It's obvious that this was the right thing because Jesus is is baptized, the heavens open up, the voice declares, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He's doing the right thing, he's setting himself apart, but as you will soon find out, doing the right thing isn't always popular, 
And doing the right thing doesn't always guarantee an easy road. Look at Jesus. Verse 4. Excuse me, chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to, the, to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones be, to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, you read it, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8, again the devil took him up on the exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, read it, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Jesus did the right thing. Matter of fact, John said, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, this is the right way. You baptize me. I believe that's said there for several reasons. One of the most important is, you don't have an excuse for not being baptized. If you truly are going to say that you are following Jesus, then follow him. We'll talk more about baptism next week. But the reality is, don't call yourself a Christian, which means Christ-like, if you're not going to do what Christ did. And while I can tell you, he told, uh, he told his disciples, and I believe it's for us too, that greater things than he did, we would be able to do. I do believe that some of the things that he did are very doable. There is no reason why you can't be baptized in Jesus' name. There is no reason why you need to hesitate to follow the example of Jesus Jesus was not baptized because he was a sinner. He was baptized because it was the right approach to beginning a ministry, to beginning a life. And we are dead in our sins until we come to Christ and he brings new life. And the best way to start it out is to start it out in the name of Jesus in the waters of baptism, just like Jesus did. If you really want to do what Jesus did, Start right there. Consider the fact that maybe some things that have always been a part of your life maybe need to be left at home. Some things that keep holding you back. This is the good time. It's the right time. Jesus ends up in the wilderness. And here we see a test. Jesus was tempted not just by his physical, emotional, and spiritual, but he was tempted at the very core of his identity. Notice, if you will, Satan says, if you are the Son of God. In other words, bringing the doubt. Bringing the question. Causing Jesus to consider, yeah, I could do that. Turn the stones to bread? He could do that. Jump off the temple and not hurt himself? He could do that. Bow down? He could have done that. But he crucified himself before he was ever crucified on the cross. He laid down all that he had and chose to be set apart. Satan came at his hunger. He was legitimately hungry. 40 days of fasting. It'll do, it'll do the same to you. And he tempts him at his appetite. That's why in our 40 days, we challenge people, 
Put the appetite on the altar. I hate throwing food away, but I have a feeling my wife is going to say, it's time for those Christmas cookies to go. But they're not old yet. (laughs) They're not stale yet. So if you can eat Christmas cookies, come see me afterwards. I may have some for you. (laughs) The reality is, it's time to clean. The Jewish feast system had a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was during this time they would go through the whole house cleaning everything to make sure that there was no leaven. Because they couldn't have any leaven in the house. This is a good time to walk through your mind and see if there's any stinking thinking. It's a good time to walk through your heart see if any of the world's idols have found a shelf. And it's a good time the time to say, Lord, search me. This was what it was for for, for Jesus. He found himself tempted at his hunger level, his physical level. He found himself tempted in the mental, in his identity. Who was he going to be? Was he going to self-promote, self-exalt? No. He crucified himself. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Strike one. He said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Strike two. And finally he said, Satan, you're out. That's what it says there. Away with you. Isn't that kind of what the umpire said, Michael, when you struck out? Out of there. (laughs) Now what they say when you get ejected from a game? Out. Game over. Jesus set himself apart on so many levels. And you know what his call for us today is? Follow me. Verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, and in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, and casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately, immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father. Mending their nets, he called them, and immediately, immediately, They left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and hearing all kinds of sickness, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who, who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The old hymn goes like this, To be like Jesus, To be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory, I only ask to be like Him. John the Baptist would never be the same. 
Jesus would never be the same. Because they chose to be set apart, other people would never be the same. Peter, James, John. And let's not forget the multitudes. You think that epileptic would ever be the same again? That person who was healed from disease never be the same. Will you be the same? 12 months from now? If you are, you'll have to give an account of the opportunities you've missed to be more like Jesus.